Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Today we have a special guest with us, which we're really excited to have on on the podcast. It's Sir John Hargrave. He's the CEO of Media Shower, the world's premier content marketing company. His new book, Mind Hacking, about how to reprogram your mind and change your life is available from Simon and Schuster coming in January of 2016. Or you can actually read a copy of the book right now at mindhacky, H-A-C-K-I dot N-G. Sir John Hargrave, welcome to Personality Hackers Podcast. Joel, Antonia, I am ready to hack some personality. <laughs> well, Excited to be here. And, and I, I asked you this question right before we went live on the air, and you said, well, it's actually a story that I might want to tell later. I, I saw this Sir John Hargrave, and I thought, man, is this guy, what, is he like English? Is he British? And then you had an American accent. I think you're from America. You're American. So what's the Sir thing about? Are you knighted? Well, in a manner of speaking, I wrote the Queen of England several years back, and I said, Your Majesty, I would like to be knighted. Because I just thought Sir John Hargrave sounded so much classier. Don't you? It does. It sounds very posh. <laughs> right. So I was thinking pretentious, but posh is good too. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I thought I'm he was joking. joking. I'm totally joking. joking. <laughs> so, so I write the Queen, and uh, she writes me back and says, uh, well, you have to do something noble. I'm like, well, that's a lot of work. <laughs> so I found out you can go down to your local county courthouse, and for a small fee – you can apply to have your name legally changed. So I did that. You go before a judge, and uh, now here I am today, Sir John Hargrave. And it's funny, people do take me a lot more seriously now with the Sir in front That's of my name. That's awesome. Well, well, and from what I can what I can understand, and, and this is actually the first time I've ever heard that story about the Sir part, but this is not the first time you've done something like this, right? In fact, you start off your book, Mind Hacking, with mm -hmm. a story about identity switching, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll call it name hacking. <laughs> How's that? Or identity name absorbing, hacking. maybe. Name hacking, that's fine. Yeah, name hacking, which ties in well to uh, the mind hacking concept we're going to talk about. But yeah, it really is easy to change your, your name, and it's also kind of symbolic that it's, it's easy to change your personality, in a sense, isn't it? Like our names and our personalities are all sort of fluid and amorphous, and it's surprising how easily and quickly, in a sense, that, that we can change those things when we put our minds to it. Cool. So... So let's start getting into this book you've written. This is a uh, Antonio and I have read it. We've read through it, and some of these concepts are really exciting to us because you talk about a lot of the same concepts that we talk about on this podcast. We talk about it, personality hacker. We talk about the fact that you do have a lot of control over your world. That it might not seem like it in the moment, but uh, if you can develop good habits in your life and good ways of thinking, you can make a lot of change happen. And so it's a really attractive concept and a really attractive book, I think, to us personally. And I think, I think if you listening right now, you're probably going to resonate with this as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess just give us a general overview. I mean, I know it's about mind hacking, but what does that mean? What do you mean mind hacking and this idea of hacking? You know, we talk about personality hacking, getting in there and tweaking things. But when you talk about the mind specifically, give us some general terms on this. Well, the, the basic concept is... As you guys know, your brain can be reprogrammed. So your brain can be reprogrammed, and I like to uh, use this phrase, you don't have to believe everything you think. So you don't have to believe everything your mind tells you, and by becoming aware of our minds, and then by uh, finding like a programmer, the kind of negative thought loops, debugging those code loops, and then reprogramming them with positive thoughts, we really can change the way that we think. And a simple example of this was given to me by uh, this guy, John Sonmez, who runs a podcast called Simple Programmer. It was a great story. He used to get really upset whenever he'd be in traffic. So whenever he'd be stuck in traffic, he'd start getting all like hot under the collar. Does anybody use that phrase, hot under the collar? I don't know where that came from. <laughs> 1950s America. Anyway, he says to himself one day, this is crazy thinking, like, what, getting upset about traffic. I can't do anything about it. And somehow he was able to become aware of that and then reprogram, rewire that thinking. So now when he's in traffic, instead of getting upset, it now kicks off this new positive loop, which is 
you know, I can use this time to listen to a podcast or to, you know, think about some problem I'm working on at work or be grateful for the traffic. And so he was able to rewire his brain to think that way. Mind hacking is a collection of those hacks or techniques that we can use to do that in our own minds. So there's a um, there's a theme through the book, basically of there's a there's a basically a metaphor you're using in the book, and you're you have a computer programming background esque nature, right? You've done some computer programming. You're very attracted to technical things. You're tech attracted to computers and the programming language of computers and the hacker culture in, you know, in computers. So you use this motif, this metaphor throughout the whole book about comparing our minds to computers that can also be hacked similar to software, uh, which is obviously a metaphor that's been used before. But I guess what approach are you bringing to the table that, that you feel hasn't been voiced yet? You know, there's, there are other books about working with the mind, about helping to change thought patterns what is, from your perspective, what do you feel like hasn't been said yet that this book attempted to say that you were hoping to get the message across with? We're at a really interesting point in human history where we now have a common understanding of the world of computers. So this world of uh, cyberspace, another totally outdated word, but this world inside our computers, <laughs> which we understand is not the physical world, and yet it is a real world that's going on in there, right? We spend most of our day in there if we're knowledge workers and email and spreadsheets and Word documents. So understanding that there's this second reality that's not a physical reality, but it is real, is very similar to our minds. And by looking at the world of computers, we can start to understand better this abstract concept of our minds, which is another world that, again, is not a physical location and yet is very real. It doesn't have reality in the same way that an object has reality, but what goes on in our mind is in, in many ways more real because it's the foundation by which everything else flows, right? Out of our minds come our thoughts and out of our thoughts come our actions. So by learning to hack our minds, we can really learn to hack our lives. We can learn to change our lives in profoundly positive directions. Put another way, the book I've always wanted to read is like a user manual for the mind. I wanted somebody to write a book, and not a self-help book with like flowers and galloping horses on the cover. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I wanted like a self-help book that I would read, like one that I would think was cool and interesting and practical, something that I could actually use that actually told me, but here's what you actually need to do to go hack your mind. Here's specific hacks or techniques, and that's, that's what the mind hacking book's all about. So can you break down your approach to mind hacking for us? Yeah, so there's really three steps. The first step is becoming aware of the mind. And, you know, if we just think about our minds for a second, um, if you just do that thought experiment, think about your mind, you realize that there is something called you, which is thinking about something called your mind. So you can easily see, logically, intellectually, that you're not your mind. You're separate from it. But learning to develop that awareness on an everyday basis that's the most difficult thing. So we have a lot of techniques to help you learn that awareness. Second step is to debug the mind. So like a programmer goes into a, uh, to a piece of software that's not working correctly, debugs it, tries to find the negative, uh, the problem code. We're trying to find our negative thought loops, the things that are holding us back. And then finally, we're reprogramming those with positive thought loops. So we're asking, what is it that I want? out of life? What is it that um, I'm, I'm looking to accomplish, my goals and hopes and dreams? And then putting those into practice first in our minds and then as they take root in our minds, they begin to show themselves uh, in, in reality in our lives. Okay, so you, you just said something that just triggered a thought for me or a question for me or I guess a distinction. You said, what do we want out of life? Mm -hmm. and, and that that's something I've been playing with in my own mind is, and, and maybe you can speak to this and some of your research and your thought around this and the writing that you've done. Uh, you didn't say focus on what you don't want in life because, you know, the right before you said reprogram the mind, you talked about debugging it. So obviously you're in there looking at the problems, looking at the things you don't want. 
but the focus wasn't around what you don't want. It's what it's around what you do want. And I thought that was an interesting uh, transition to that point. And I, I think that might be, from my perspective, one of the leverage points that may be very high on the list is that we're foc- you're focusing on what you do want. And I bet very few people in this world do that. We tend to focus on the things we don't want, the problems we're trying to solve rather than the the solutions we want or the desires of our hearts. Is that is that a clear question, I guess, or a clear thought? And if you yeah. can maybe make some distinction around that in some of your research, that would be interesting to me personally. Yeah, that's. I think you're absolutely right, Jewel, that most people, if you ask them what they want out of life, they have only a vague idea like a pony. Something <laughs> not... <laughs> Not really ambitious and probably not even very well defined. However, we all have things we don't want in our lives. Those are very easy for us to pinpoint. But what do you want? What do you want? A lot of the book goes into helping you determine what it is that you want because that is is critical. My, I, You guys are, are parents, and my wife uh, is an excellent mom of our two kids, and one of the things that she taught me early on, she read all these parenting books, and she said, listen, um, the rule of thumb when you're trying to direct your children, especially young children, is you want to avoid saying no or stop at what you want to try to do is say what you want them to do instead. So if they come with like a hammer and start hitting the glass coffee table, everybody's reaction is to scream no and shout and run and go grab the, the hammer. But you still want to get the hammer out of their hands. But then to say you know, (laughs) toy hammer only, (laughs) or, you know, shop eBay for new coffee table, (laughs) but telling them what it is you want them to do instead of just reacting and saying, don't do that. That's the hardest thing to learn, I think, as a parent. Um, My child, my uh, eight-year-old, was leaning on the edge of the chair, and it drives me crazy, the armrest of the chair this morning, and I had to say, please... I beg of you, sit in the seat instead of on the arm. In the seat, please. And so that's the kind of thinking that we want to treat our own mind. Our minds, in many ways, are like children, and we have to try to say, what is it that you want, mind? What is it that you want out of life? And then take those positive thought loops and use those to create our new programming, our new thought loops. And and that's... I mean, you, you basically mentioned it as a parent, when you, when you are attempting to re- rephrase things or reframe them in the positive, it, it, it's like a whole new skill set that you have to retrain your brain to think in those terms. Totally. Um, and so you're talking about basically things that you have to exercise your mind to do. And I, and I, my observation has been that we, we kind of believe we all come out of the hatch with certain things just sort of given to us, like the ability to be a good parent or the ability to be an amazing mate or the ability to whatever it is that we think we should already come out of the hatch with. And when we go, oh, these are actually skills I have to develop, then there's the sense of like, okay, so now how do I develop the skill? Because I thought I was just going to be naturally good at this. And I think my guess is that my instinct tells me that people make the assumption that thinking in the positive is something that's going to be easy, right? Because it, it feels like it should feel good to think in the positive. <laughs> I, I think it's actually quite a struggle. And one thing that you mentioned in the book that is an assist to this, or at least this is what I got, so correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that assists with this is a better imagination, like being able to imagine the positive thing that you want to go toward, being able to picture in your head like the the eventual, like you said, what do I want, a, a, a pony? Like, no, you don't really want a pony. <laughs> like, what is it that you actually want? Like, build, construct, architect in your mind what you actually want and then be able to reframe your brain to start using words that head that direction. So it's not just even the ability to imagine what you want, but then it's being able to program your brain to frame your your internal dialogue to head that direction in the positive. Um, can, and then you talked about like becoming better with imagination. Can, would you be willing to talk about that that piece a little bit? Yeah, this is a great question. The, uh, what uh, resonated with me was that phrase, build, construct, and architect uh, what you want. I love that because that is what imagination is all about. It does feel like you're building or constructing or architecting something in your mind when you're really thinking about what it is 
you want. And like building or constructing, it's it's work. It's work to imagine well, to really consciously uh, leverage your powers of imagination. So in the book, we have a lot of hacks to help you think of those things, and some of them take the form of stories or uh, kind of scenarios, mind games we call them. One of them is uh, is the funeral speech. So, you know, one day, Joel, Antonia, we're going to be dead. I'm sorry to break the news <laughs> what? to you. Yeah. And uh, at our funeral, because we have, apparently we have a joint funeral, the three of us, I don't know why, but all three of us in our funeral, they're going to stand up and say something about us. And uh, what is it that you want them to say about your life? What is it that you want to be remembered for? And you can just come up with a word, a word like generosity or education or love, whatever that word is that you want to be remembered for. That's one of the kind of hacks that you can use to think about what is it that I want? And out of that, you can then figure out, okay, well, what am I going to do about that? How am I going to get to that goal? But those are some of the tools or techniques we can use to develop those imaginative powers. I knew we were destined to be BFFs. I knew we were going to have a joint funeral. I knew that. I just could tell from the beginning of the conversation. Hey, so, uh, John, I got a question about imagination. So, and from your perspective, again, I don't expect to have all the answers for all these things I'm asking, but I'm just really curious what your take is on this. So, a lot of times when I've, I've read a lot about imagination, you know, when you read books about manifesting or imagining something or creating a mind, you know, like one of those mind boards where you're you're putting like a collage up of the things you want to manifest in your life. Uh, you know, the different people, different schools of thought have different ways of thinking about this. And I'm just curious what your approach is. Some people talk about the repetition of the imagination is important. You know, like you re repeat, you kind of stir it over for a period of time. Other people talk about getting really detailed about the imagination experience. Like the real, like you want to know the exact color of shirt you're going to be wearing when you're standing on that business stage, giving that presentation for the big successful client or, you know, you're, you're, you're sitting there writing that, you know, signing autographs for the book you just wrote in a Barnes and Noble in, you know, this exact city at this time to really feel the detail. And other people talk about the emotional intensity of the imagination. So you want to feel the emotions behind the imaginative experience. It's not so much about repetition or detail. It's about all the feelings you bring to the table. And I'm sure it's all of those things, but have you found, or, or maybe it's a fourth or fifth or multiple thing that's even more important than any of those three. Those are the three I've seemed to have I've identified as, I, as I've read this information about really getting into imagining a different life for yourself. Uh, have you have you had any insight into this, or is it really just a blend of a bunch of different stuff? Yeah, we have a chapter in the book called Simulation, and one of the studies that we quote there is uh, where they had two groups of students, and one of the uh, student one of the groups they said. Uh, visualize yourself getting a good grade in this class at the end of the semester. And to the other group of students, they said, visualize or simulate the series of steps that you're going to need to get a good grade. So in other words, uh, think about how you're going to study, uh, how you may have to say no to a party so that you can really get this information down, think about taking the test, getting a good night's sleep beforehand, and then getting the good grade. And consistently, they found the students who simulated the entire process, including the problems and how they were going to overcome those problems, scored consistently higher on the test, like up to a full letter grade higher. So what the research shows is that visualization of the end state does not work as well as the simulation of the entire process, mm. including how you're going to deal with the challenges. And that's how Jack Nicklaus approached uh, golf, like, you know, regarded as the greatest golfer of all time by many people. And he said every shot, he pictured the entire shot from the initial swing all the way through to the, the final roll of the ball. And by doing that, it always simulated this positive uh, approach to every shot in his mind. So the simulation rather than visualization has been shown to work. One other uh, study showed that when we uh, picture ourselves in the third person instead of the first person, we also are more likely to affect change. Really? And 
Yeah, so again, this study is in the book, but uh, two groups of people, one of them pictured themselves from the first person, you know, like a first person shooter type game, and then the other one, uh, other group visualized themselves from a third person or watching themselves, and the third person group consistently did better as well. So that's another mind hack that I think is helpful for that topic. I, I also like this idea that you've given this language of mental loops. By the way, thanks for that answer. I think that's actually really good. So it it is about going through that you know that full process. Do you have more questions about that? Because I got this other. He's stimulating my mind so much. I've got <laughs> no. so much stuff to unpack. But cool. you want to mention something on that? No, I was just going to say that it was a really good uh, clarification or distinction between um, imagining something versus running the simulation from from beginning to end. I think that that's a really good sort of distinction of how to go about, you know, the visualization, not just visualizing the end result, but actually running the simulation of all of the different, like maybe even contingency plans that you would have to do from A to Z to get to the end result. It, it, it's not an ending snapshot. It's you're literally running like a test software program through yeah. its entire paces and you're seeing all yes. the steps going through that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And I mean, in my experience, when you do that on an ongoing basis, like a daily basis, I do it in the shower, by the way, and it, what it does is it prepares you for the problems that you're likely to run into. And you can start to think, okay, I, you know, you kind of get a head start on how am I going to deal with these things. But also it gives you a confidence because, you know, well, listen, I've, I've already run all these simulations in my mind where I overcame these problems. So I know I can overcome this one, even if it was not something I expected. Yeah, I was just about to say that if you run simulations that include challenges, even if the challenge you face is something that you were not anticipating, just having gone through different challenge scenarios probably gives you more confidence. Yeah, that's a really now this is gonna be a super personal question, but what kind of how are you? I mean, what is your morning visualization in the shower? Can you give me an example of? Is it the same every day? Do you switch it up based on what you're going to be doing that day? Is it more about your life in general, or is it about the day? Is it more about the month? How do you? What's that experience like? And how do you yeah. go through those paces? Well, I'll take you into the shower with me, Joel. <laughs> the Let's media the shower. <laughs> Fantastic, Joel. Yeah. yeah, so my, my company is called Media Shower, so this is a funny topic. Not because it's done in the shower, but that is just coincidental. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, a lot of business goals, um, obviously goals for the book, for the Mind Hacking program. And as part of that, uh, there are... These are usually longer term goals, so they're you know goals for the year, for example, uh, and some of them are even longer than that. But working through those each day and again simulating, okay, well, here's where we want to get, here's where we are right now, what's the sort of short term horizon, and how are we going to um, you know work through those problems, and how are we eventually then going to make it all the way to the end goal. And again, it's all laid out in the book to help you do this in your own life, but that's that's what it looks like for me in the shower. And I hope that's the last time we have to visualize me in the shower. No, it's, I don't want to visualize you in the shower so much as <laughs> I don't either. I, I actually want to, uh, I, I guess I wanted to get more, and, and if you could give me an example of exactly how your mind is working on this. I know I'm really getting personal probably, and you could tell me to just go take a hike and get away from you. Uh, don't ask me these personal questions, but do you have like, like literally, are you thinking about like, see, I know you're running these simulations, but what does that actually look like tangibly? I know there's exercises in the book, but for right now, for that person that's listening, if you're listening, they probably want to hear just a little snippet of an example. And I'm, I know I'm pushing you for that, but I, I'd like to hear that too. I think that would really be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will, I will bear my soul to just since I'm in the shower anyway. <laughs> Now I'll peel off the skin and show you everything underneath. No, okay, so let's take mind hacking. So the goal is to sell 100,000 copies of the mind hacking book when it goes on sale in January 2016. And by the way, you can pre-order a copy now at Amazon. Help me get to that goal. But anyway, here we are in the shower, and we're thinking about, okay, well, uh, we got six months before this book uh, drops, and what are we going to be doing in the meantime? So doing a lot of pre-publicity working through a lot of this, but also thinking about, well, what other opportunities are we going to have to get the word out about this? Um, what kind of problems are we going to run into as we try to do that advanced publicity? How are we going to balance that with everything else going on and all the other priorities? But then at the same time, we have like an app that goes along with mind hacking. That's a great way that we can, you know, get even more mind hackers involved with this. So how can we improve the quality of that app and that program and what are the problems we're going to run into there and get to that goal 
And then when it goes, when the book actually goes live, you know, what <laughs> what are the things that are going to come up then in terms of potential issues and how will we successfully resolve all of those? And by doing that day after day, you know, you really do start, things start to occur to you, but you also, your sensors are on high alert so that when you, somebody comes and says something to you, it registers in a different kind of way. You're more open to opportunities. And there's a lot of psych research that shows when we do that kind of simulation, it does make us more receptive to opportunities. Another way of saying it is you make your own luck. But I just like thinking of it as like, you're more optimistic and you're more likely to notice those opportunities as they arise. Did yeah. that help? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate that because I think it's for me to hear something real tangible gives me something to latch my, you know, my mind around. And I think you listening will probably appreciate it as well. Uh, so yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I think it gives me more. So just as a as an example from this, I just, again, just want to say this. So you you gave a lot of stuff and you're going through a lot of things during that morning routine, that morning thought exercise routine. But it might be something like okay, a hundred thousand copies and our and you might say, you know, we want to have a launch date. So that launch date, we need to pre-focus to sell this many. And you're starting to back out. You're backing out all the steps to get to that, for example. And you're just reworking those steps over and over again. And you're and you're actually going through some of the same thoughts every single day. So you're creating this like a pattern of thought almost. Or do you find yourself changing those thoughts as you go through? Yeah. Well, you keep it loose. These are great questions. Nobody's asked this in this level of detail, but. I, I keep it loose. So in other words, I'm like kind of letting, you know, it's a, the shower is good because you're sort of, you know, in a relaxed state and your mind can kind of wander a little bit. So in other words, it's like, okay, well, here's what we want to get to, but I'm not, it's not like a drill sergeant taskmaster. We're going to do A, B, and C. It's not a battle plan. It's more like a free association of how are we going to get from point A to point B? What are the problems we're likely to run into? Where, you know, where do we need things to go right? Who are we going to need? What resources are we going to need? And then doing it kind of differently each day, trying to think of new things that you you haven't thought of before. And I don't think there's anything wrong with imagining then the final state. I think that's important too. So you do have to imagine as part of that simulation, the students in the study still imagine they got good grades. So it's still important to imagine, okay, at the end of this, we do sell 100,000 copies and, you know, there's interest in a follow-up book and we've got this great growing community of mind hackers and we're changing the world and making things better. Um, that's part of it too. How do you prevent yourself from you, – in the book, you talk about this concept of asking five whys, right? So you're going to do something and you ask yourself, well, why? And then when you get the answer to that, you ask yourself why? And then when you get the answer, you keep going down the rabbit hole like five times at least to get to the true nature of what you're actually trying to accomplish. It might be an emotion you're trying to feel or it might be whatever. And the whys get you to the actual essence of what's going on. Have you found a tension between, you know, so you're doing these thought exercises every day. Do you find yourself now re-questioning yourself? What I, what I have a tendency to do, and I don't know if this is what – it's just unique to me or other people, but now I'm, because I've built this discipline, I might be imagining something and now I'm asking a why or I'm asking questions and that's opening a whole nother can of worms of things I hadn't even thought about. And that leads me down a rabbit trail of unfocus, which from the book, it talks a lot, you talk a lot about focusing your mind and being intentional. And it seems like the more you do these thought exercises, the more free association, the more not unintentional you get, but the more distracted you might get because your mind is going off on different directions. You, you get to understand the question. Uh, is it, so? because you, you said it wasn't a battle plan. It's not like you're constructing A through Z and it's a tactical or strategic plan. It's more of a, a, a way of thinking about how you're going to go about this. So how do you balance the yeah. tension between opening more loops and keeping the ones that you already have open about what you want focused and your mind focused on those? Well, the, the five whys technique um, is meant as a debugging technique. So this would be the second step where we're trying to debug our minds. We're trying to find the negative thought loops that are holding us back. And these are things like, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough or, you know, I don't have the resources of other people. Whatever those things we tell ourselves why we can't get to what we want. And five whys comes from a, a production technique that was started by uh, Toyota, who founded uh, the company that's now the Toyota Motor Company. And when something goes wrong in your factory, you ask why five times until you get to the root of what the problem was. You don't just look at the surface. 
but the, the problem as it, as it manifests itself, you look at the root of the problem. And so in our thinking, by asking why five times, we're trying to get back to the root problem. Now, uh, what we recommend is when you use this technique, it should be to debug areas of pain. So an area of pain in your life is anywhere where things are not going as smoothly as you would like, right? So this would be anxiety or depression or you have problems in a relationship or your job. Any of those areas of pain where you know like there's a problem going on here and I know I have something to do with this, but I'm not quite sure what it is or I can't articulate it in words yet. And so five whys is a hack or a technique you can use to help you get to that problem thought. So in that context, you know, you, you may, Joel, because of what you do, like I hear you saying it's almost like a, an overanalyzing <laughs> of what's going on and maybe yeah. that's what's happening. But I think for most folks, you know, self introspection is, is hard enough, but uh, um, using it when you've got something problematic or serious that really needs to be, to be debugged is is, is the best time to use it. And otherwise you could probably leave well enough alone. Right, well, so then the answer is a matter of chronology. So Joel's question was, how do you not have them conflict? And it's because they're used in different contexts. The why question is used to debug, and then the visualization simulation process is used to reprogram. That, that makes so a lot of sense, yeah. It's more a matter of state. What I, what I find happening for me though, is in the process of reprogramming, I just continually are opening loops. And so, <laughs> and so uh, I'm gonna think more about this, and I'll probably talk to you later, John, on another podcast or offline, and, and ask you some more nuanced questions around that specifically. Mm -hmm. for, for me personally, uh, but this is all great stuff, by the uh, way. Yeah, no, I love I love that the book, and just a major plug for the book, by the way. Um, I really love that the book gives so many practical steps and exercises for building skills in all these different areas. Because it's fundamentally, like you mentioned, it's fundamentally three areas: awareness, and then debugging, and then reprogramming. And um, and each of those phases has a set of exercises that come with it to build the skill. Um, there was a really interesting question that was suggested that we didn't get to. Um, and I, I, I'm I, curious as to what your answer is on this about the distinction between what you think is the distinction between uh, being aware, like having awareness of how your mind is working and being able to watch your thoughts versus meditation. Um, and I, I always think of meditation as a form of doing that. But what would you say is a distinction? We, in the book, have uh, what we call concentration training, uh, which I, I think of as Jedi training. Mm -hmm. That's just me. So we call it Jedi <laughs> training or concentration training, but it's essentially what many people know as mindfulness or meditation, except that we do it a little bit differently. So first of all, it's, it's a foundational mind hack. It's the thing that we recommend before any of these other mind hacks because it does help develop that awareness. Um, the way ours is different is you spend about 20 minutes, uh, preferably in the morning, just concentrating on your breath. And as you do that, when you notice yourself lost in the thought stream or you notice your mind chasing thoughts, um, you award yourself a point. We call them awareness points. So you kind of treat it like a video game. And traditionally in meditation, when you notice yourself thinking, you kind of most people feel bad, and then they return themselves to the to the breath. But for us, you feel good. You get a little dopamine hit because you're thinking, uh, you know, that was a success. I noticed it, and now I'm going to return back. You get a point for that, and you record your score each day in the app. So we kind of gamify it. So uh, using that technique of concentration training, which I do every morning. Um, is incredibly helpful in developing that awareness in your everyday life. And the point I always try to make is when you do that training or meditation, you're not doing it just for the time that you're there in concentration training. You're doing it for the rest of your life. So what happens is throughout the day, you start to become aware of like, wait a minute, my mind just like, told me this thing <laughs> about myself that is not true or that I don't want to believe anymore and you start to become aware of that and I use the uh, analogy of going into a movie theater and when you watch a movie the beginning of the movie you may not really be into it you're kinda of like analyzing the movie but if it's a good movie you get lost in it you just like identify with the movie and you have to remind yourself I'm watching a movie 
So that's what our minds are like on an everyday basis, and this training can help pull us out of that. It can help uh, show us that there's a you that's that's watching your mind, and and again, you can can be in control of your mind if you can develop that awareness. Yeah, we just did a podcast on the idea that when you are at a decision point, you pretty much like the decision you make is an inevitable decision because the system that got you there, whatever you decided was the inevitable emergent of the entire system that got you to that moment, that decision point. So all the real decisions we make in life are actually the what we call pre-programming the GPS unit. Like in an airplane, when you go on autopilot, it's not like nobody's flying the plane. It's that you've pre-programmed something into the GPS that allows the plane to have specific instructions. And what I'm taking away is that a lot of the exercises you're talking about in mind hacking are ways to pre-program your GPS. Like you said, you're not just meditating for that morning. You're actually, you're basically programming your GPS unit so that when you get to a moment of decision, you won't be so caught up in the movie that you're in right? You won't be so lost that you actually have trained yourself to be able to be aware, conscientious. You've basically pre-programmed your GPS so that when you get there, you have a lot more control over the outcome effectively. Is that kind of on target? Is that a decent metaphor for what we're talking about? Yeah, I heard that podcast. It was really good. It's a very, very interesting uh, idea. And, you know, uh, Gandhi once said, "Your, your thoughts become your actions, your actions become your habits and your habits become your destiny. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I said it. I don't know why I said it in the Hollywood movie voice, but that's that's what he said. I, I love it. Yeah, I love it. Uh, so we we actually uh, we should probably wrap up because we're getting at a certain time. We want to um, honor your time commitments. The the last thing though, if it's okay, or did you have something, Joel, that you wanted to ask before we wrap up? Um, I, and this might be actually a can of worms that I'm asking at the very end, but this concept of the reality distortion field uh, that you mentioned in your book, that Steve Jobs, people talked about him having a reality distortion field, or we call it the reality distortion tunnel. And we almost always think of this, like we, we talk about it in almost kind of a negative connotation. But what I love about what you've talked about is that you can actually use it for good because we, we all have a reality distortion tunnel <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. It's just whether or not yours is one that's serving you or one that's limiting your options. So uh, would you be willing to speak a little bit on, on that topic of creating a reality distortion field that serves you? Yeah, that's one of my favorite stories in the book, and it comes from the late Steve Jobs, as you mentioned. His co-workers described him as having a reality distortion field. And so one of the original programmers on the Macintosh computer uh, came in, and one of, the, one of the seasoned guys said, listen, you're going to go into this meeting, and Jobs is going to want this software done in 10 weeks. And the new guy said, that's impossible. We can't do it. He said, I know but he's got a reality distortion field. And even when you're aware of it, it's going to affect you, and you're going to come out of the meeting totally convinced that you can do this. I said, okay, goes into the meeting, comes out totally convinced he can do it. And so Jobs had this sense of, uh, of, of anything being possible. When he really believed in something, it was almost like a force field that was so strong that it pulled other people into its orbit. He sucked other people into this belief that this thing is possible. And when we're thinking about what we want out of life and who we want to be, I believe that we all have within us the power to create our own reality distortion field. And as you said, Antonio, one that, that, that serves us, so if we can say, you know, uh, I want to be this thing and believe in it so strongly, another way of saying it is fake it till you make it, but really inhabit that role, almost like you're playing a character in a play, that this is the person that I want to be, and being that person with everyone else, over time, if you do that again and again, you will tend to become that person. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that idea of the reality distortion field, I love it, and I think it's possible for all of us. This is good stuff. So if you're listening, you can actually get right now a copy, a digital copy of John's book. And John, where can they find that again? That's at mindhacky.ng. So it's like mindhacking with the .ng, no .com. Okay, so mindhacky.ng. You can you can get the book now. It's an advanced digital copy. 
And then I'd li- encourage you when the book comes out, let's uh, let's let's all get this because I think I think this kind of stuff needs to be out there in the world. And I really like the approach you've taken. I, I was just telling you right before we started recording, John, how I've read a lot of books about the mind and how you can alter your mindset, and they're real heady. A lot of them are academic or heady or real. You know, it's dense material to get through. You've got to take a long time. And I just whipped through your book. Like it was an easy read, yeah. but not easy in that the material is dumbed down. No. It was a very accessible. Yes, it was accessible. It yeah. was down to earth. It was practical. And I love your writing style. I love the story at the story, beginning. I'm not even going to yeah. say it, but it grips you just like, <laughs> whoa, what? And it's such an interesting story. So I'd recommend that if you're listening to go and get a uh, you know, get a copy of the digital copy of this. Read it. It's a great, a great read. And if you're having trouble with that URL, uh, go to our website to this podcast. In the podcast notes, we'll have a link to the the digital book. Absolutely, John. Anything we didn't ask you? Anything you're like, man? I wish they'd asked me this question, or I got to get this message out to the world. This is like the the one thing I wish they had had asked me. Anything like that that you'd like to give us as parting words? I want to just say how great your podcast is. Um, it really, you guys are so thoughtful and you have such uh, an interesting take on this material and also you're so articulate about it. Like just the questions you asked today were really smart, well-informed, thoughtful questions. So I uh, I commend you guys on putting out a really great great podcast here and I hope that everyone listening <laughs> thanks them and passes it along and subscribes and leaves great feedback because <laughs> they've earned it. It's hard work to do a good podcast. It's hard work and these guys have done a great job. Uh, thank you, John. It was a total pleasure to have you and be able to get, go through your material. It's 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 really, I mean, it's it's so in alignment with what we're doing and how we think that it's kind of almost self-congratulatory to go, go get his book. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's basically like that. that's kind of our take too. So I, I have a feeling we'll be talking again and, and doing something together again in the future because I'm resonating with the material. I'm resonating with you as a person. And I really I really appreciate you coming on board. Yeah, totally. So uh, again, the, so that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, so if you're listening, you can find the link to John's digital copy of his book at our website or you can go directly to that which is mindhacky, H-A-C-K-I dot N-G. And you can go ahead and get an advanced digital copy of that. And then make sure you, you can pre-order it on, on Amazon right now. And I would recommend that if you're resonating with the material to do that, you can leave a comment or ask a question directly under this podcast at our website, personalityhacker.com. Or you can grow join our growing community of like minds over at facebook.com forward slash personalityhacker. So John... Godspeed. <laughs> well wishes on the book. I hope it. I hope you sell your. Yeah. It was a hundred thousand copies. Is that or two hundred thousand? What was the metric? I hope that happens for you. A hundred thousand for now. For now, we can yeah. go higher. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that happens for you, and I hope it. I hope it wildly gets out there because I think it's yeah. great information. So thanks for being on board. And my name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We'll talk to you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. Mm-hmm.